Here we are at uh, 10.6, find segment lengths in circles, and I think I'm ready to lead you through this uh, section in uh, hopefully an efficient and uh, clear way, simple way for you. So are, are you ready? Have you written down the essential question? How do I find segment lengths in circles? And I think I have all this stuff here in your notes, yep. So when two chords, remember chord is going from, oh, here it is, oh, I have to show this to you, but you remember uh, in 10.1 chord goes from uh, both the endpoints of the segment of a chord are on uh, the circle. So here's one chord going all the way across and here's another chord. And when those two chords intersect in the interior of a circle, each chord is divided into segments that are called segments of a chord. That makes sense, of course. So the whole thing's a chord, but this is a segment. This is a portion of that chord. And we have a theorem here telling us that uh, if these two chords intersect in the interior of a circle, then, and they go and put in words this part here, but I'm going to say this one word, which is a lot simpler, proportional. So when two chords intersect inside interior to a circle, then the chord segments are proportional with each other in the same way that we have been familiar with, with uh, similar triangles. So all we have to do is put a fraction bar across, equal sign and fraction bar. So AE over DE is equal to EC over EB. And then if you were to solve that by cross multiplying this proportion, you would get AE times EB, which is what you have here. AE times EB uh, equals, and it would be EC times ED. <clears throat> Does not matter, of course, the order since they're being multiplied. Uh, 3 times 4 is 12, and 12 times, or uh, 4 times 3. Whether it's 3 times 4 or 4 times 3, you still get uh, the same number. You can commute those things, you know that. So that's nice. Very simple uh, theorem uh, for us. And it's because these two triangles are similar uh, to each other. I won't go through and prove that now. The book does not prove that. They're just kind of giving you a hint uh, of that. So here's a uh, an example problem uh, for us and again we look at we have two chords here's one chord here is another chord and they intersect interior to the circle uh, therefore the segments of these two chords are proportional to each other so in this particular case they set up the fraction bars uh, in this way. So they say x plus 2 over x equals x plus 4 over x plus 1. And then they cross multiply it. Uh, just so you know, you could have done it, or they could have done it, uh, this way to say x over x plus 1 equals x plus 2 over x plus 4. Or you could take the reciprocal of both of those. So there's four different ways you could uh, set this thing up and either way you're still going to get the same answer at the end. Uh, when you do cross multiply this proportion you're going to get x times x plus 4. See how we're cross multiplying across these for equal sign and the fraction bars uh, equals x plus 1 times x plus 2. Again, that's uh, cross multiplying. So now, this is all algebra. Let's make sure we know how to do this. So we distribute this x inside the parentheses. x times x is x squared. x times 4 is 4x. And here we have two binomials. Remember the problem we did recently where you had a binomial squared? So for example, if you had x plus 3 squared, it's a 3, that's equal to x plus 3 times x plus 3. So a binomial squared is that binomial times itself. And then we 
uh, distributed inside the parentheses there. And that's the same thing we're doing here. Here we have two different binomials. But uh, here I take this and kind of blow it up, make it bigger to remind you how to distribute the x inside the parentheses first of all. x times x is x squared. x times 2 is 2x. And then distribute the 1 inside the parentheses. 1 times x is 1x. And 1 times 2 is 2. And then uh, combine like terms. So 2x plus 1x gives you 3x. So that's how they get this x squared plus 3x plus 2 uh, here in the book. The rest is pretty simple. You might be intimidated by these uh, squared terms, but you can subtract x squared from both sides and they drop out. Very nice. And then let's bring all the x's over to one side. So subtract 3x from both sides and you get x equals 2. And then you plug that x equals 2 into uh, whichever expression you're looking to find the length of the, the segment there. All right, so all that's based on this cool little formula theorem that if we have two chords that intersect each other inside the circle, the segments of these chords are proportional. Now let's talk about secants, because secants a little bit different, a little more complicated. This stuff you have, or from the uh, book you have here in your notes. So remember a secant? Let me show that to you. Where did it go? Remember a secant is where it uh, intersects a circle twice. So a secant is a line. This has been 10.1. Uh, intersect circle twice as opposed to a tangent intersects the circle only once. So we're talking about here a secant segment. Well here's your your secant segment and the uh, the uh, the part on the outside here they're going to call that the external segment. So secant uh, can be a segment. In this case it uh, uh, has exactly one endpoint outside. So here's your one endpoint that's outside the circle and so the other endpoint is on the uh, circle. So a, a unique situation uh, here with this uh, segment, uh, secant segment. And then just to get you familiar with the uh, with the term, remind you about that. Here is a tangent segment that uh, is uh, uh, starts from the one of the endpoints is on this point of tangency uh, with with uh, regard to the circle. Now let's look at uh, segments of secant's theorem. And if we have two secant's segments that share the same endpoint, so here is the same. Uh, endpoint outside of the circle, then the product of the part and whole are equal to the part and whole, is my simple way of saying it to you. Now you might be thinking, hey, uh, this looks like what we had done before, because you could draw a triangle uh, here, and there's a smaller triangle and a bigger triangle. And remember in chapter 6, we had uh, similar triangles. As long as we know that these two sides are parallel, then the smaller triangle is similar to the larger triangle. And we could do all kinds of different proportions uh, with these four different uh, segments, or we could even do uh, the small over the whole and so forth. Well, that does not apply directly to this situation. And the reason for that is because if you were to draw these two sides of your triangles, uh, these two sides are not always, in fact they're almost always, um, not, <laughs> whatever I said here, they, they are almost ne never, almost never, almost, yeah, almost never parallel. You cannot assume, that's a better way of saying it, you cannot assume that these two sides are parallel. Here's a clear example of that. Oop, I forgot to 
draw there. Let me go ahead and do that. So, so here's your little blue triangle. And let me see if I can get a, a red pin. And here is your big red triangle. And notice when it's drawn like this, or in this type of a situation, it's clear that these two sides are not parallel to each other. So therefore, do not use the same ratio dealy bob um, arrangement pattern that we did with similarities, uh, kind of like what we, we did here. Don't use the same simple uh, proportion. Instead, because remember before, we part over hole equals part over hole. Well, in this case, uh, we need to do part times whole equals part times whole. So wh what do I mean by that? Well, here's your part, EA times EB, this entire green uh, segment uh, here, equals the EC, the part, times the whole of uh, ED, the, the, the blue there. So when you have these uh, segments of secants, then if you were to make triangles, yes, they are similar, but they're not in the same orientation. Maybe that's the easiest way to say it. They are similar, but they're not in the same orientation, as you can see here. And therefore, it, the easiest way of thinking about it is just do part over whole, part over whole. Okay, so I guess I should have done no, I did. I did that example, example number one, for the intersection being interior. Now we're ready to do example number two. Here's an intersection outside. Okay, so we have a, here are two uh, secant segments and the intersection is outside of the circle. And therefore we need to do a part. This is four times the whole which would be five times four. So that's where they get this, four times five times four. So in other words, nine equals three, which is the part time, or yeah, times the whole, which is X plus three. Again, part times whole equals part times whole. So then we end up with this uh, equation and we solve this simply by well, in this case, we uh, five, five plus four equals nine. Nine plus uh, four equals 36. But over here, we need to distribute the three inside the parentheses, so three times x, and three times three is nine. And then, of course, subtract nine from both sides, and then divide both sides by three, and you get x equals nine for the length of this segment. And you can do the rest of this stuff. Yep, all that's pretty simple. Just be careful again. It's uh, part times the whole equals part times the, the whole. So go ahead and pause the video and uh, do those three problems if you would please. On your notes, hopefully I left you enough room to be able to do that. Maybe on uh, number three, you might want to start up and do it. Do the up over here on the, the right side. Then theorem 10.6, let's jump into this. Now, it's not before we had two segment or secant segments, but now we only have one secant segment and the other one is a tangent segment. This guy up here is a tangent segment. It only intersects the circle at one point and it's a little bit different but really the same because remember we did uh, part times whole equals part times whole same deal here so oops I forgot to mark that pink so the part would be your pink here EC is your pink times the whole ED that's your secant segment and here for your tangent segment, well, the part is also the whole. So you have part times whole or EA times EA, which gives us EA squared. So it is the same, same idea. 
same idea, just a little bit uh, different because the part equals the whole when you have a tangent segment. So let me give you an example here of how to do that. So here is a secant segment and then here is a tangent segment and they don't even tell us that this is a tangent do they? No they don't. They should but in this case we can assume that uh, RQ is a is tangent uh, to the circle. So we want to do part. Here's the part of 8 times the whole of x plus 8. So there's uh, oh I messed it up didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I did mess it up. Uh, the part needs to be, again, think of your, uh, here's a, a small triangle, and then here is the larger uh, triangle. So the part needs to be the, the smaller uh, triangle of X, so not the 8. Don't make that mistake, like I just did. But uh, you use the part um, of the smaller triangle, this uh, X, times uh, x plus 8, the uh, the whole. So maybe I should have said small and large triangles. That might have been a better terms to be able to use. And then over here for your tangent segment, uh, that is uh, the part and the whole are equal to each other. Same, same length, they're congruent. And so we just have 16 times 16. So here's your equation now. Uh, 16 squared is 256 and distribute this x inside the parentheses. x times x is x squared and x times 8 is 8x. So there you go. There's your equation and last time or in previous times when we had a square term we were able to subtract that square term from both sides and it would cancel out. In this case it doesn't work. Uh-oh. So what we do is we put this guy into the standard form and I've put that here on your notes standard form for a quadratic equation quadratic in contrast to a linear linear equation would be uh, remember y equals mx plus b uh, is our standard form for uh, linear just to give you a linear uh, standard form linear equation I guess I'll say okay just to uh, connect that with prior knowledge but you've done this before uh, so standard form for a quadratic is ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. We did this in uh, algebra one and the easiest way to solve this quadratic equation is to use our quadratic formula. Remember that dude? So x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac and all of that over 2a. So I've given that to you here in your notes to remind you of the quadratic formula and that is what they use here in the textbook. So your a term in this particular situation is going to be 1 because there's an invisible one there. Your b term is going to be 8 and your c term is negative 256. So when they say uh, so here is your I want to make sure I'm still in the video here. There we go. Here's your quadratic formula. So the negative of whatever b is, my b is 8, so it's negative 8, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so it's 8 squared, minus 4 times a, which in this case is 1, uh, times c, and the c is negative 256. So we can simplify all this underneath the square root term and then you would simplify that square root term and you'd get uh, so then divide it by 2 and you'd get uh, negative 4 plus or minus 4 square root of 17. So we probably need to review how to handle and simplify radicals these uh, square roots. And uh, since we are looking for a distance here that's going to be a positive. Yeah. Our distance here, that's going to be a positive number. And therefore, we're going to use negative uh, 4 plus 4 square root of 4, 17, sorry, uh, which is approximately, if we round it off to nearest uh, 100th, it's going to be 12.49. Uh, okay, so 
we are going to have to do some work with a quadratic equation in uh, this this section. So I think you're ready now to do these three, but tell you what, before I cut you loose, let me just show you this example. I don't know why they put it in the back here, but uh, uh, I took a, a uh, astronomy class in uh, uh, college. It's fascinating, and it is all geometry and math. So they're telling us here that uh, Tithis, might be the way you pronounce that, Calypso and Telesto are three of Saturn's moons. So here are three of Saturn's moons and they orbit in uh, nearly a circular orbit that uh, has a certain radius and uh, JPL was a part, JPL is a civilian company, was part of uh, sending out this uh, Cassini and Hujins. I think Hujins is the Japanese company that was working with uh, JPL. My friend works for JPL and um, they uh, and he was part of the team that uh, sent out uh, this Cassini uh, spacecraft and it uh, went around Saturn, orbited uh, Saturn and took pictures and samples and all kinds of cool, not samples, was, uh, I'm almost certain it did not land, but uh, was able to take close-up uh, samples or close-up pictures and uh, other sensors uh, from Saturn. So here they're saying, you know, what if it was in a situation where Cassini was out here and it was a tangent line to Telesto, the one, one of the three uh, moons, and it was lined up exactly with Calypso and, uh, I just pronounce it again, Telths, what might be how I say that. Uh, if you knew the distance to the one moon and also the second moon, then uh, using our part times whole equals part times whole, you could figure out uh, the distance between Calypso and uh, this uh, third uh, moon, doing uh, using the same uh, theorem that we uh, have uh, worked on right here and here. Okay, so you are ready to go. Uh, thank you for your hard work, exercise your brain, and we'll see you soon.